Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Mark Monitor's webinar, Successful Enforcement Strategies in Chinese Marketplaces. We'll be discussing the complexities of protecting your brand in these marketplaces, and as well as key strategies for brand monitoring and enforcement. I'm Anya Jerbo of Mark Monitor. And before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to run everyone through a few housekeeping items. During today's webinar, all participants' lines will be muted to ensure that there is no background noise. And following our presentation, we'll be holding a Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to submit them during the tab that you see on your screen. And um, you can also submit them at the end of the session. For um, any questions that we don't have time to answer during the webinar today, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the event. We are recording today's webinar, and we plan to send out a follow-up email to all registrants with a link to the recording and presentation slides. So now I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today's presentation. We are joined by Mark Monitor brand protection expert, Trevor Robbins. Trevor is a brand protection analyst at Mark Monitor and is responsible for leveraging complex technologies and industry best practices to develop strategies which effectively disrupt illegitimate online activities infringing on the trademarks, products, or services of brand owners globally. And now I'll go ahead and turn things over to Trevor to get us started. Trevor? Hi, thank you for that great introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, I think we have a lot of interesting material to go over and I'm excited to present. So. And then Anya, I'm not actually seeing the slide deck. Um, sorry about that brief uh, technical difficulty. I have it now. Yeah, hold on a second. You should be able to see them. They're actually in the meeting room. Let me check. Can you see them now? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'm going to go over uh, just a brief summary of our agenda. Why is the Chinese market important? Um, some of the opportunities and challenges that the Chinese market presents. Uh, what are some best practices for brand protection and effective enforcement? And a couple of tips of avoiding and resolving enforcement issues. So to kind of preface that, um, we all know that the gravitation towards enforcement efforts in China is a topic that is coming up more and more. And that makes sense because China is not only representing a place where a lot of counterfeit goods are being manufactured, but China also represents a very real growth opportunity market for brand owners um, and operators um, having to not only compete with counterfeit goods going out of the Asian region, but also having to try and compete to be able to have their products um, you know, take hold in these emerging markets. And there are a lot of real pain points for brand owners that are associated with this. But if you add on top of that, um, you know, it's different operating in China. And I mean, it's extremely different. So you enable to be able to have success. You can't take what you do in other parts of the world and just put it in there and have success. There's some really important components that you have to be able to do. And the good news is that um, there's a lot of investment being made in understanding those nuances and processes uh, and being able to do this, you know, really focusing on some of the suggestions we're going to present in these slides. Um, we're going to try and showcase what it is that you can do and what professional service organizations can help you accomplish. Um, and highlight some of the big differentiators between, you know, kind of trying to go it alone or you know, knowing where the value is with engaging in some local partnerships. So let's get some of the interesting things out of the way regarding the Chinese market. Um, as I said before, it's you know, not a conversation that's going to weigh. How do you engage with the market and how do you 
be adaptable in order to be successful when protecting your brand uh, within the space. So the Chinese internet economy is massive with over 645 million internet users. And I'm always shocked when I read this, even though I know it's true. Um, so the number of internet users in China outnumber the entire U.S. population two to one. So roughly 46% of all internet users worldwide are in China and they're actively engaging in e-commerce. And e-commerce sales in China are massive. So Chinese online shoppers currently number more than 350 million people. And we're talking about $800 that are spent annually per Chinese citizen who are online shopping. Um, and online sales outpace those of the U.S. who has traditionally been the, you know, longtime leader in online shopping. So let's take a look at the landscape. Um, our conversation today is going to focus primarily in China, but you can see how these uh, emerging marketplaces are taking hold all throughout the region. So primarily we're going to focus on talking about the biggest players within China, which are, of course, uh, the Alibaba Group. And then we also have other emerging exchanges such as PiPi, um, Yahoo Hong Kong, which are you know, going to kind of define the e-commerce landscape in the coming years. And um, it's important to know where to focus your efforts. And we're going to talk about how to have a multi-pronged approach and how to engage with these different marketplaces and be able to, you know, accommodate to the nuances that are associated with not only the country, but the different regions within the country. So more opportunities and challenge. So we're talking about major local purchasing power with $800 per netizen spending um, money in China online, but also just the you know incredible growth and potential with the emerging Chinese e-commerce market. Um, and again, it's the world's workshop for legitimate and counterfeit goods. So not only do you have to address uh, local distributions of your you know authentic goods, but we're also talking about how to combat counterfeit goods um, that are leaving the region. So the production and sale of counterfeit goods is global, absolutely, multi-billion dollar problem, and it has serious economic ramifications for businesses and consumers. So counterfeit sales represent 7% of all global trade. And if you just think about that, I mean, you can have a sense of just what the magnitude of the problem really is. And it's, of course, intimidating, and it's a very complex process as a brand owner to engage with this problem. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of some of the main points we're going to cover. And if you take anything away from this presentation, um, at least these couple of points on what brand owners should be doing in order to protect their intellectual property rights and protect themselves and their businesses. Um, success always starts with a strong IP portfolio. And you'd be surprised how many brand owners are kind of, you know, taken aback that their own portfolios might not be as strong as they think they are. Um, and that boils down to, you know, regional nuances and regional requirements, as well as just not thinking, hey, if I have my product that is in a certain class, maybe you're not thinking about protecting it in other classes. Um, it, there's just so much that can be accomplished by knowing that you have a, you know, very strong and assertive portfolio. And then understanding the scope of the problem, uh, some of the general facts that I just threw out about the size of, you know, counterfeiting in general as a, you know, a problem, um, know what the size of the problem is and what kind of resources that you as a brand owner need to dedicate into, you know, developing a successful enforcement strategy. Um, the importance of regional monitoring enforcement, so having boots on the ground, having local partners, having native speakers, and especially engaging with, you know, regional legal counsel 
to make sure that you know your IP portfolio is as strong as it possibly can be and you are getting the most out of the expertise that's out there in order to you know develop your own brand protection strategy. And then again, building a strong IP portfolio. So I mentioned that we need to make sure that you know brands are being or trademarks rather are being registered in all relevant regions and classes. Um, it's not simply enough to have them within, you know, say the United States or within Europe. You need to think about that growth potential and that opportunity for counterfeiters uh, in all regions. So um, an example for you know, making sure you have all of your registrations in, you know, any relevant class that could be misconstrued with your brand. Uh, say you're a shoe uh, manufacturer, and you're surprised to find out that there is a backpack manufacturer in China who is actually, you know, kind of hijacked or brand jacked your trademark to making bags. Uh, suddenly you're losing, you know, some valuable opportunity of having local leverage legally to protect your brand in that space and prevent, you know, these brand jackers from, uh, you know, stealing your intellectual property. Uh, meeting country-specific requirements. So you would be amazed at how many brand owners, you know, think they have a pretty good handle on their intellectual property portfolio. They know where their trademark certificate originals are. However, they don't have access to the original copies. Um, they're not preparing their documents in a way that the, say, you know, Chinese agencies, the government, the marketplaces in China will accept. So it's important to know exactly what the requirements are for each regional marketplace. And this can be something like having a colored copy or making sure that it has an original wet ink signature on it. Um, it's very important to have kind of a checklist and, you know, be very comfortable with the documentation associated with your intellectual property. And then being able to prove um, that your company owns the trademarks that you're presenting to these marketplaces. So companies change. The economy is dynamic. We change our uh, addresses. We change our, you know, names commonly. So it's important to be able to provide a chain of custody and to be able to provide documentation showing that you, in fact, are the rights holder to this intellectual property, even though maybe it's changed hands a few times during the evolution of your business. Um, and then again, registering trademarks prior to the launch of new products. And this one's a big one because we oftentimes see that we have an ability to leverage the fact knowing that, say, you know, I as a brand owner have this product that's supposed to come out in July. Well, knowing that, if somebody's already making it before I release it in July, that provides me an opportunity to leverage local resources and local legal counsel to kind of mitigate some of that brand jacking and some of that theft of your intellectual property before the actual release of the product. It gives you a runway to establish your documentation. Um, so definitely be aware of what your, you know, marketing and your product development teams are doing and incorporate that into your internal workflow for securing that chain of custody between your intellectual property rights and the documentation required to protect them uh, when engaging with Chinese marketplaces. So again, engaging with local counsel, local resources, um, having native speakers, having people who can help you navigate the lay of the land. I mean, the Chinese legal landscape is very different and it's evolving constantly. So with that kind of growing ecosystem, having people on the ground that can, you know, walk across the street and have a conversation, um, talk with people on a managerial level at these marketplaces, that's extremely valuable. Um, copyrighted images are a huge factor we've learned when dealing with counterfeit items. So maybe something seems just close enough to your product that you're comfortable to call it counterfeit. Um, copyright imagery might be the only way that you can actually get it down. And especially with, you know, apparel verticals and um, 
markets that are constantly adapting to seasonal changes, uh, it's really important that you maintain a reference library of your copyrighted work. So that way, you can use that as a tool to get product down that you believe is you know, infringing off these marketplaces. And that when the, the you know, analysts or the marketplace representatives go to review your claims, um, that they have something that they can you know, validate your complaint with. And then, again, maintain updated patent portfolio to complement copyright and trademark enforcement efforts. So oftentimes, brand owners want to use their WIPO patents, um, you know, pretty much any, anything they can to get things down off the basis of design. If the counterfeiters are able to kind of circumnavigate copyright or trademark infringement on a very general level, having that chain of custody and having those approval documents from the Chinese government to go along with your trademarks and your patents are extremely helpful. So understanding the scope of your underlying problem. Before you make a concerted effort to engage with infringers and try to protect your brand, you want to know what the size of the problem is. You want to know the you know, potential impact is. Um, and a question that we hear often is, you know, do you believe that 1% uh, of your sales are, at, you know, at least 1% of your sales are being lost to counterfeiters and almost everyone will raise their hands? You raise that question to 5% and you'll still see most brand owners raise their hands. Uh, so knowing the size of the problem will help you develop a dedicated strategy um, and help you benchmark before you engage with these marketplaces so that you know at the end of your efforts or a year down the road or two years down the road, you can really measure the impact that you've had. And if you're not seeing the impact that you'd like, then that gives you a, you know, a starting point to um, change your efforts or change the focus to hopefully get you know, some better results. So make your brand a hard target. Of course, we can't take down everything off of all these websites that are generally associated with counterfeit products. But what we can do is clean up most of the marketplace so that people searching for, you know, potential customers, consumers, when they're searching for your product, they are most likely going to find a genuine item and they're not going to find a counterfeit item, you know, on the first 10 pages or 20 pages of search results. Um, and when you have a multi-pronged effort, when you're going after multiple marketplaces at the same time, um, I think you're, you know, you're really going to see an impact on how consumers are, you know, reaching legitimate products and how fewer consumers are finding counterfeit goods and being duped. And then know the difference between counterfeit, gray market, and legitimate items. So counterfeit can be extremely, you know, straightforward at times. Um, and I spoke previously to, you know, use copyright to get stuff down fast. You know, leverage all the low-hanging fruit, if you will, to clean up those first few pages of marketplaces. But when we talk about gray market, it can be extremely difficult to navigate. And that's not just a problem in China or Asia in general. Uh, even domestically, uh, it can be really hard. So be sure you know exactly who your distributors are, because there have been so many examples of brand owners who aren't totally sure how many of their licensees have actually granted licenses to other parties. So kind of at the bottom of that pyramid, what you see are legitimate products being mixed with counterfeit products. And it definitely muddies the waters and makes it very difficult to create a successful brand enforcement strategy. Um, so categorize those different uh, types of abuse that you're, you're encountering and then attack them appropriately uh, based on, you know, if they're counterfeit a gray market or if they're legitimate, so it's, you know, a distribution issue. 
and then prioritize and escalate enforcement for persistent sellers. Um, so one thing we see often are controlled buys being done uh, without due diligence as far as documentation. So if you're trying to build a case based upon a controlled purchase um, of an item you suspect to be counterfeit, uh, it's important to document it every single step of the way. So we want photographs of the package as it is on your doorstep. Uh, we want to see, you know, the product being opened. We want to see just, you know, everything being shored up to make sure that you have the best case possible to present to any Chinese marketplace why you are, you know, concerned, why you are confident that the item is in fact counterfeit, and that is enabling you to leverage your relationship that you're building with this marketplace to hopefully, um, you know, kind of mitigate what these large-scale persistent counterfeiters are doing. And we have to be careful about that. So the reason we want to make sure that everything is so thoroughly documented and that everything is very clear as far as establishing that chain of custody between the seller and you as you make these controlled purchases, uh, you don't want to end up on what we call banned list. You don't want to be ostracized by marketplaces because you're not being responsive or not kind of following the guidelines that they've established. And it's very easy to, you know, think that, okay, well, this marketplace just isn't playing ball. They don't want to take things down because I told them to. So we're going to confront them and think we're going to get results that way. Well, it just doesn't work that way. You know, you have to play by the rules. You have to understand that there is nuance and, you know, have an idea of the underlying complexities about building trust and relationships with those marketplaces. And again, a great way to do that is make sure that you're engaged with local resources. So be prepared to constantly evolve your enforcement strategy. Every time that you think that you've, you know, one up the counterfeiter uh, or an otherwise infringing seller, um, they're going to adapt their strategy because this is also their livelihood that they're trying to protect. So you have to be flexible. You can't have a non-dynamic strategy when engaging with the marketplaces. You have to have options on the table. And again, engaging with a professional services organization that can help you kind of evolve that strategy. You know, you have a resource of individuals who've, you know, seen everything and can kind of predict behavior. So that can be extremely helpful. Um, and yeah, being able to adapt your internal processes. Um, marketplaces, even though regionally they seem very similar, um, they all have kind of their own way of doing things. So having a really good understanding of what each marketplace is going to require and what, you know, difficulties you're probably going to encounter when engaging with them uh, is extremely important. Um, understand your distribution partners. Know who your affiliates are. Know who your licensees are. So if you're going after, you know, a marketplace that is notorious for having, you know, counterfeit goods, um, you don't want to be causing problems in your own, you know, distribution lines by going after some of these, you know, mixed with counterfeit, without counterfeit, not knowing who your licensees are as sellers and their, you know, eBay stores or their um, other marketplace stores. Um, and then make sure you maintain those separate goals and strategies for addressing gray market versus counterfeit. So if we know who our licensees are, then we can mitigate causing problems with our own distributors. Um, but if we can identify the difference between our gray market, um, maybe the supply chain is getting muddled somewhere versus, you know, this is counterfeit, this is a knockoff, you create separate strategies for each. Of course, there should be, you know, it's all a part of an overall brand protection strategy, but by keeping them separate, you're going to have better success with both. And then set realistic goals that prioritize making counterfeit versions of your products harder to find by consumers. So when we talked about 
you know, maybe we can keep the first 10 pages clean, or maybe we can keep the first 100 search results clean um, by first benchmarking the scale of the problem. It's a lot easier to measure success if you say, okay, we're going to have X many pages of each marketplace that I don't want to see any counterfeit products on. And I mean, those are long-term and short-term wins. Again, utilize local professional native speakers for review. It's hard enough to navigate the nuances of Chinese marketplaces um, in addition to a language and cultural barrier. So by engaging with local resources, be they legal counsel or professional service organizations, you're really putting yourself in a much better place so you're not you know, wasting all your time trying to figure out you know, what the documents are actually saying or you know, how to apply for certain permissions or how to actually set up your presence with these marketplaces. Um, having local resources will streamline that process and make everything so much easier so you can focus on the more important goal, which is protecting your intellectual property. Um, escalating unresolved issues outside of the standard intellectual property rights process. So we talk about that banned list. Um, being too aggressive and not being responsive to the feedback that you are getting uh, can really be a detriment to, you know, kind of the long-term goals of your, of your brand protection strategy. So you have to be sensitive to cultural differences and you have to be sensitive to, you know, the guidelines that these marketplaces have established. Um, and don't think about your brand protection strategy as just, you know, how many listings that I get taken down, how many, you know, products that I keep from ending up on the market, there's a wealth of very valuable data that you are getting from this process. So um, we're not only talking about, you know, high value targets and the products themselves that are counterfeit that are coming out of China, but who's selling them, you know, what region are they in? What is their audience? Um, and how are they doing things differently than other sellers. So there's a lot of data that you can, you know, really leverage when you're trying to shape, you know, what's your long-term strategy. If you are diligent about analyzing the data that you gather from this process and from your, from your brand protection efforts, um, you can predict a lot of what bad actors or infringers are going to do. And you can put preemptive measures in place to, you know, kind of mitigate their activity. And then just in summary, just be you know, flexible. It's a changing market, rapidly changing market. It's a changing landscape for your brand, um, but be diligent, you know. Enforce on what you can, take down what you can, make it measured and make it very tactical. And make sure that you have a strategy in place before you even initiate your engagement with these marketplaces so that you can really measure your success and then adjust your program to the constantly changing ecosystem of the Chinese marketplaces. And be creative. Uh, counterfeiters, infringers, bad actors, they're going to be constantly adjusting their strategies in order to address you know, your response to the infringement. So be willing to come up with new solutions, try new things, but just make sure that it's calculated and careful so that you're not, you know, creating opportunities for damaging your relationship with uh, these marketplaces. And then engage, please engage with a, you know, professional services organization or a managed services organization. Um, find a partner that has already done the footwork in building these relationships with marketplaces. That's already, you know, kind of gone through the nuance that understand how they operate. Um, and you're going to have much better success in the long run as far as compliance goes and the volume of material that you're able to keep off the marketplace. And again, a, you know, engaging with a professional service organization, um, we, you know, there's already understanding, there's so much work that's been done into knowing the complexities of each marketplace, you know, be it documentation, how you actually enforce, or, you know, what you should or shouldn't 
present um, as problems, know how to navigate that, and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So leverage these relationships, and these can help you succeed with not only your typical enforcement issues, but problems to each brand owner that are actually unique. Because everything sometimes takes, you know, <laughs> it requires a different approach. So an uh, auto manufacturer is not going to need the same approach as, you know, perhaps the luxury apparel manufacturer. So I'm going to give you just a couple examples here. Um, so we have, so we can pretty much throw any brand in here. Um, a global brand trademarked in China for a product that the owner did not make in a class they had not already registered for by an infringer. So that's when we're talking about, say, you know, maybe you're a brand owner who makes ski doos or motorcycles, but then suddenly you're seeing backpacks with your brand name uh, plastered all over it. Well, you're, you know, you lose a lot of opportunities to have legal recourse locally if you're not preemptively registering trademarks with your brand for classes that, you know, maybe you don't know if you're going to move into manufacturing that type of product, or if it's related to your existing trademark, maybe it's important that you preemptively, you know, secure it so you don't have to worry down the line that someone else is plastering your brand all over a product um, that you haven't authorized. So another, a brand laughs in securing their renewal certificates and change of address documentation. So one of the big struggles that um, brand owners tend to face when engaging with Chinese marketplaces is not having that, you know, really diligently maintained documentation related to their trademarks and their brand. Um, you changed your headquarters to a different state or to a different country even, um, if you can't draw that, you know, line of custody between the old and the new, then these Chinese marketplaces, they're going to push back and they're going to look for a reason why, you know, they shouldn't trust the kind of documentation that you're providing. And that definitely moves you closer to being on one of those banned lists if you're not being responsive, if the marketplaces are telling you, hey, please provide, a, you know, a documentation chain of custody um, based upon the changes that have happened within your company. And then keep your brand protection strategists um, up to date with new products. So there's a lot of opportunity to leverage changes in your own distribution plans um, with Chinese marketplaces. So say that you have a product that you are planning to release in six months, and you know that if you see anything like that product, before your official launch, and that's leverage for you to say, no, this is counterfeit or this isn't authorized. There are so many opportunities when you are being very aware of the timing of your new product releases and launches. So in summary, there's such a huge amount of potential in revenue opportunity for Chinese marketplaces, but there's also this huge opportunity opportunity, um, which has been apparent of, you know, losing opportunities uh, against counterfeiters and against bad actors and infringers. So there's a lot of risk and potential. Um, and don't get discouraged with the challenges. We say again and again, be flexible, be dynamic, because counterfeiters and bad actors and infringers, they're going to continue to change their behavior. So if you're being proactive about addressing the issue and you're being creative on how to address their own changes, then you're going to have a huge amount of success. And again, 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 find a local partner. Make sure that you have local resources and experts to help you navigate through this very complex landscape. And leverage best practices. Um, you know, leverage those relationships that have already been built between brand protection experts and these marketplaces and leverage somebody who knows the nuance between, um, you know, Chinese marketplaces because, as I said at the very beginning, you can't simply apply a strategy to the Chinese landscape 
and expect it to work the same way it does in other parts of the world. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Anya. I think we're going to do some Q&A. Uh, thanks, Trevor. And thank you for doing such a great overview today. So we are now ready for the Q&A session. We've had some questions coming during the presentation. And, and again, as a reminder, if you have a question and you'd like us to answer it, please submit it through the Q&A tab that you see on your screen. Um, and that, Trevor, maybe I'll turn it back to you um, if you're ready for your first question. We have a couple of them in the, in the tab. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a lot of good questions, actually. Let's see. So one, do counterfeit sellers just move to other marketplaces? Um, so that's a very good question. You think that maybe you shut down one store or you um, have kind of eradicated their presence from a certain marketplace. Odds are that if you find a counterfeiter, especially if it's on a large scale on one marketplace, they are already, you know, having a presence in the other marketplaces. Um, so that comes into some of the data that you're gathering. So when you enforce on the seller or you enforce on, you know, any kind of infringer and see that they have a large presence on that marketplace, try and find out where they are already. So look at the other marketplaces, see if you can, you know, connect the dots or employ some investigative uh, research into attacking all of their marketplace presences at once. So what you're ultimately trying to do is discourage them from, you know, taking your brand and profiting from it. So attacking them on all fronts is going to cause a, a much bigger headache for them. And hopefully it'll be what it takes to get them to leave your brand alone. And most likely they, they will actually move to a different brand. So and that all plays into making yourself a hard target. So is it realistic to think you can identify manufacturing sources of counterfeit goods in China? And do you recommend use of private investigators for this purpose? Uh, absolutely. So it's very difficult to get to the actual source of the products. And generally when you take down these small storefronts, what you're doing is just, you know, eliminating a small number of these distribution partners that the counterfeiters have. Uh, Again, collect all the data that you can about, you know, if you see the same illegitimate products coming from multiple sources, I think it's definitely worth investigating um, on a local level and having boots on the ground to kind of build that case and find the source. Oh, is it important to trademark, uh, trademark localized translations of my marks? Definitely. Um, and this is something that I see all the time where you think that having your brand or your trademark um, in the main market, so say it's in English just because you primarily sell uh, in North America, uh, it's very important to find out what the transliterations are locally, especially in China. Make sure that you have those marks because oftentimes what counterfeiters or other infringers will do is put your product, you know, on Chinese marketplaces and they will only have the Chinese character version of your trademark in the title. And that presents a problem for enforcement because when you try to take down some of these listings that you're confident are counterfeit, um, the Chinese marketplaces are going to push back and they're going to say, well, they didn't actually use, you know, the English word that your trademark says. Um, they've used the Chinese transliteration. So absolutely make sure that you have localized translations of your trademarks. Oh, so what can I do if I can tell by intuition that a seller is selling counterfeit goods, but I can't really prove it based on the listing? So this is a question we get all the time. Um, when we talked about controlled purchases, uh, I mentioned that you want to make sure that you have a thoroughly documented chain of custody. So from, you know, the payment processor that you use to purchase the item 
for controlled purchase, all the way down to making sure you're photographing the package when it gets on your doorstep and you're, you know, recording your opening of it and you're being very diligent about, you know, building a case that you can then present to Chinese marketplaces because they will want to make sure that, you know, everything has been thoroughly documented. So um, another option is if you're really convinced that something is counterfeit, but maybe you don't have the ability to prove that the actual good itself is counterfeit to the marketplace, utilize things like copyright infringement. Maybe they have something from your website on their listing. That's a fast and effective way to get product down. Um, maybe that they're using your trademark in a way that you're not you know, fully expecting. So they have your brand name on the product itself. You're pretty sure it's counterfeit, but it might not be, but they've thrown your logo somewhere on their listing. That could, again, be another leverage point to get the listing down. All right, and I think that's the bulk of the questions, Anya. Okay, well, thank you for such a great presentation again today. And I would also like to thank you, our audience, for your participation. And as a reminder, we'll be sending out a, sending out a follow-up email with a link to this presentation as well as the slides um, very shortly. And for additional questions and information on Mark Monitor's uh, solutions, services, and complementary educational events, please feel free to contact us by email, phone, or by visiting our website. That concludes our webinar for today. Thanks again for tuning in, and have a great day, everyone.